We spared no expense on three sides of whatever the fuck this show's called. <laughs> All that we have to say this week on three sides is a we coin. Word. Michael James Jackson. We got it. You're going to get it. <laughs> you just got to hit play. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of your three co-hosts, Michael Branville, joined by Mark Cicchini, Tommy Summers. Hey, uh, quiet please, it's a little noisy. Shh. The gift that just keeps on giving. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm feeling good. It's a sunny day. Let, let, listen, you, 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 you two chat because obviously we do no pre-production, so I didn't even think of this. Chat for a little bit. Okay, what, so, well, uh, yeah, what's that? Okay, so I want to mention something. Billy Davis, a listener of ours, sent me this information for all of you people that are out in the New York area. This might be of interest to you. Uh, it's about Kiss at the Daisy. It's a 45th anniversary fan celebration at Carney's Irish Pub and Restaurant, and that's 136 Broadway in Amityville. This is going to be on March 9th, 2018. And it says performing, uh, the Kiss cover band performing the Daisy set of 1973. The name of the Kiss cover band is Unmasked. Special guests will be Lou Lynette, which is the first Kiss manager interviewing via Skype. More guests to be announced. Uh, visit, uh, visit Kiss, or excuse me, Unmasked Kiss cover band on Facebook for tickets. So March 9th, 2018 at the Carney's Irish Pub and Restaurant in Amityville. The Amityville. I tell you what, um, I have a funny story since we're waiting for Michael. Um, one of the auction houses used to be out in Amityville. And um, one time my buddy and I, before the New York convention, went out to Amityville. And they let us in the rumor at all the, all the auction stuff. And the guy just left us back there by ourselves. And every oh, time I remember you said that. Amityville. <laughs> They're like, the guy's like. Uh, basically, you know, turn off the light when you even like the unmasked costumes were there and all this other stuff that were was up for auction. And I, you know, I'm a big football looking guy, but my buddy was really skinny. My buddy was like putting everything on. And, wow, and that sounds did, kind and, of interesting and familiar. And we didn't have the we didn't have cell phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? He missed that. <laughs> Couldn't take pictures. So I just wish you know we would have had time to. Who would to, look at who would look at kiss stuff like that and put it on? If there was boxes of Kiss costumes, and you're there on a on a on a, on a Saturday morning, and just some guy drinking a coffee, he's like, "Yeah, go down the room, the, the light. I put the light on for you because I called him and told him we came from Detroit to do this." Yeah. Yeah, because what it is is, matter of fact, my Paul Stanley outfit that's down there that I bought from the auction. There was two of them, and I wanted the stage one. Can you show that? Because we I've never seen that before. Is it possible with the camera where you are? Am I, show, am I showing? I keep showing. Here's my Gino. Yeah, I see that. And there's there's an Ace Paul, one. Yeah. Well, where, where, where's your Paul underwear? <laughs> Do you can you order that? Does it exist? Is that a thing? I think it got thrown at him at a concert like that. Ozzy meat hit the him Ozzy. in the face. And then he wore it the rest of the concert like this. <laughs> The Ozzy Meat story. It's funny too because my, my buddy Rick was with me when it happened. That was that was a, probably the craziest fucking thing that's ever happened to the concert. All right, all right. I you know I I could only find two of the three because I'm so freaking unorganized. I'm I'm not like a vinyl geek here. You know I got uh -huh. vinyl just piled up anywhere. We promised this to you last week. We did. I was too busy yapping. And we deliver. <laughs> we deliver. Yes. That album. That album. And Killers. I just, it's somewhere here. I couldn't find it because I don't have anything alphabetized or in any sort of freaking order. This guy. That I guy, wonder how he would have right felt there. about 
knowing that you signed one of those records. <laughs> that guy. That guy I just pointed to. He was here this week. Quite possibly the best oh. or one of them. I enjoyed this oh. one pretty much. Oh. This Even was more. a five Kleenex box episode, not just five Kleenexes. Boxes of them. Minutia. No, no, no minutia. Major nusha. A whole new word that three sides of the coin invented. Major nusha. This week. Mm-hmm. Pretty guys, much. Guys, look. We come here each week for you. We have a lot of fun. But this one was for us. Us three were bonded together going, this, oh, this is the one. This was this so good. This is the one. So... Like we always say, guys, we're only difference is we're on the side of the fucking camera. <laughs> I'm hoping you guys feel the way we do at the end of this interview. Because let me tell you, what an incredible man he is! How great he was! How gracious he was! With he answered everything to the best of his ability. And I also want to say too, he was still under the weather. We gave him an option to even postpone this another week, and he's like, "No, man, I'm going to see how I do." So. If so to our special guest, the three sides salute. Thank you so much, man. It, again, we're still giddy because, as you guys know, we record the beginning at the end. So, so, so let, let's. We've got Michael James Jackson here, and I'm not going to give you the answers, but here's just a few of the questions he answered. Did Ace record anything? Did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? It's Marcus Swinger. The, don't ruin a good thing, Tommy. <laughs> Jesus. The drum sound on Creatures. Michael James Jackson producing Animal Eyes. And something about, oh, the general tone and the direction of Creatures of the Night and where it came from and who was involved with it and, and what was driving it. And so just much play more. It. Just, and just, play. just play it. Yeah, just play just it. Just listen. Yeah. There's so much good stuff here. Oh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roll it. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. So, Three Sides of the Coin, we are so super, super excited to welcome our very special guest, Michael James Jackson. Hell yeah. Now, now let me give, because, Michael, we, we, we have listeners and, and, and viewers of our show that run from 1974, when KISS first started, to last year they just discovered kiss so we never assume everybody knows the history of the band so let me just say if you're a kiss fan and the name michael james jackson doesn't immediately hit you as somebody important in history i'm going to tell you to pull three albums out kiss killers creatures of the night and lick it up those three albums feature michael james jackson involved as the producer nothing more needs to be said on that so michael first i i think the first big question we and 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 all kiss fans sort of want to know is where have you been all these years <laughs> you mean since those years <laughs> since since <laughs> yeah. ex exactly exactly i um I continued making records until about 1996, and then I um, decided I wanted to take a break. I had also done music supervision for about nine different films, <laughs> and I um, I started a company called Manuscript Originals with Graham Nash and a few other music business associates, and I became the president of that company, and the thrust of the company was to honor the classic songs of our times and the emotional role that those songs played in people's lives. 
And the way that we did this, we went to famous songwriters. And we gave them museum archival paper, 11 by 14 paper, with hand-torn deckled edges. We had them hand write out the, the title and lyrics of their most famous songs and then illustrate it in any way they wanted. They could paint on the page. They could make caricatures. They could do whatever they wanted. But it, it lent a particular kind of character to it. For example, with John Lee Hooker, John Lee was illiterate. So when I sat with John Lee and we were going to do boom, boom, he'd look at me and I'd say B and he'd make a B and then he'd look at me and I'd say O and he'd make an O. And he drew a guitar that was like a Picasso guitar. And it was so stunning to me that uh, this was a man who held a guitar his whole life, but he had difficulty drawing the shape. So, and that was, he was one of the, the key figures that really had a big impact on me. Should I keep talking about this? Sure. Yeah, Michael, yeah. Please, I, I, we're I, fascinated. Please. Yeah, I have a question, Michael. Was that made into a print? Because I want to say I saw something um, like that in a gallery once. Were, were there were there prints did, of his um, illustration? Did prints do illustrations? No, no, no. A print. P-R-I-N-T. What we would do is that we would create a series of originals. And each original was unique to that artist and was entirely different. Each one of those originals was then scanned and we produced um, like an edition of a thousand, which were then pencil signed by the, art, the artist slash songwriter <clears throat> and numbered by us and accompanied by a certificate and so on and so forth. So this was about the emotional relationship people have with great songs and honoring those songs and honoring that relationship. John Lee Hooker was particularly unique because when they brought me into the room with him, there he sat on a couch with his hat on watching a football game. Mm -hmm. And they, they motioned to me to go and sit right next to him, which I did. And he didn't even look at me. And I felt very awkward. And I looked back at the manager like, this is kind of fucked up. Am I in the wrong place? And... I said, no, no, just wait. And without looking at me, John Lee Hooker said, so do you love what you do? And I sat there, and I was so taken aback because it had not occurred to me to really consider that question before. I knew I loved making records, but this was an extension of that. This was about the relationship people have with music and songs and how it either drives their lives, it informs their lives, it enriches their lives. Uh, so I thought, really thought about this question. I sat there silently next to him while he was watching his football game, and, it, and I really I came to an answer. And I said to him, I said, you know, you're right. I really do love what this thing is. Music has been such a huge part of my life, and the impact that it can have on people in, in affecting their lives is so powerful. And I'm very proud to be building this with Graham Nash. And then and only then did John Lee Hooker turn and look at me and, and smiled and he said, that's good. It's good to love what you do. Uh -huh. and, I, and I thought he, he was like a holy man to me. That, oh, that's, great that's a great story. It's funny, you know, I'm a big blues fan and I actually like a lot of his music. Um, whenever people talk about rock and roll and, you know, being devil's music and stuff, I always wonder if you're familiar with uh, John Lee Hooker's song, is it the devil blues? Where, oh no, it's Burn in Hell, that's the one, where he's talking about there's no God, there's no devil, you, you know, Burn in Hell. I always wondered, like, in this, if you were a mother in the 50s or 60s, and you heard that coming out of your kid's room, I mean, they talk about all, you know, all the things, and uh, especially Kiss, you know, the Knights and Satan service, and before that, sure, Al sure. Cooper, and, and I'm like, but if you go back and listen to some John Lee Hooker and some of those blues tunes, you know, uh, there's some there's some crazy stuff going on that I can imagine really shocked parents um, uh, long yeah, ago. Well, I mean, he told me that, you know, I said, where'd Boom Boom come from? He told me that he when he was in Chicago, he used to um, play at this particular blues club and he'd go in there, but he was always late. And there was a beautiful blonde bartender, and every time he'd walk in, she'd make her hand into a pistol. She pointed at him and she'd say, "Boom, boom, John Lee, you're late." Mm. And he wrote, "He wrote, boom, boom" for her. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, 
the genesis of songs, the genesis of where things came from. I mean, John Lee Hooker was such a wild character and womanizer as well. He 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 had some different, a lot of different wives, and he had a lot of different children. But he was dedicated to making sure that his each one of those kids had a house. And in order to be able to make enough money to to keep taking care of these kids, he kept signing record deals with different labels under different names, so that mm-hmm. he would have different product coming out. It was all John Lee Hooker, but it was under a different name, and they pay that new named person. And um, that's actually clever. That's just, you know, that kind of stuff is just great history. Well, he's he's a he's a he's, he's got a nice Detroit uh, connection too. Uh, and Boogie Chillin talks about walking down Hastings Street, and I've worked on Hastings Street lots of times here in Detroit. And every time I'm over there, I'm like, I always first thing that pops in my mind. Yeah. Uh, um, I've got a question for you. Not I know this is a Kiss podcast, so we're going to get to all that. But in my childhood, Michael um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash was a really big part of it because I've got a brother who's ten years older, and he was into to Bob Dylan, and he was into Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and Zeppelin, and so on. Um, and you may not be able to answer this, but this is something that I've always been curious about. Graham Nash seems like such a genuinely kind and wonderful soul. Uh, as does, um, you know, uh, even Neil Young. Um, but I always see these interviews with David Crosby where he seems to just pretty much dump on everybody. Is that an act or is he actually like that? I can't really answer that because the, the one of them that I know the very best, obviously, is Graham, who, who I've been, you know, we built that company t- together until the recession hit and we had to, to pause and stop. But I know Graham really well. Crosby, I don't know really well, but I know what you're talking about. And you always hear about these kind of snarky yeah. you know, interviews that, that go on, and these barbs that go back and forth. And you kind of initially write it off and think, well, it's kind of bitchy like a, a married couple that's been together for such a long time. But can't really address that. Because okay. I just thought I'd ask in case you maybe knew, because I just have seen him take shots at a lot of different artists, not necessarily back and forth with, with the guys in the Crosby, Stills, and Nash, but just, you know, Kiss in particular, he would take shots at them. Well, they have to wear makeup so they don't know how to play and their music sucks and da, 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 all that kind of stuff. And it's just one of those few things that have, has stuck with me because it's like, I like them too. Just like I like Paul McCartney or I like the Rolling Stones or choose any number of artists. I always think that that kind of um, uh, nastiness is really completely unnecessary. Everybody is allowed to kind of be who they are. Yeah. And if you take a David Crosby, who's really an acoustic artist and a premier vocalist, and you take Kiss, they're such entirely different animals. Neither one has, the, to me, the right to really criticize the other. Right. Because Kiss is much more about musicianship. It's much more about than about you know a particular song it really is a state of mind that's one of the things i've always thought that they put forward and it's powerful and it's engaging and it's liberating and that's kiss is a, a different kind of artist you can't say well there there's kiss and what there's kiss and alice cooper or there's kiss and somebody else with makeup on the makeup is only a part of it, to me. Right. It's not, hey, we got makeup and aren't we really kabuki and isn't that cool? So, you know, I understand what you're saying. But I think it's refreshing to hear your point of view like that because that's one of the things I often wonder about and we always ask guests uh, like yourself when you come on is, you know, what's your, how, do, how do they fit into the world of music and how, how do you look at that? You know, I was on the Kiss Cruise this past year. <laughs> and I've my nature is kind of always to be hesitant about doing things like that. I generally don't put myself out there in that way. And uh, it's just not particularly appealing. I don't have a need for it, whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, Paul was very encouraging, and, you know, let's go do it and so forth. And so I went and did it. And I had a, a really big realization 
I realized how important these songs and the music was to the fans. I realized mm-hmm. how important being a KISS fan was to a KISS fan, which is just a unique kind of thing unto itself. And the, this was a tribal event. All these people came to be part of the tribe and to enjoy that. And they were kind of very interested in me because one guy came up and said, you know, you've avoided doing interviews about you know your time with KISS for years and years and years. And I said, yeah, it's just not really something I do. He said, but I realized that you were on this crew, so it was important for me to meet you because of this, this, and this. Yeah. And I, and after a while, I felt so embraced by these people and so much the object of their interest that I felt very humbled by it and very uh, respectful of the KISS fans. Because KISS fans are different than Bon Jovi fans. They're different than Aerosmith fans. They're yep. different than Joni Mitchell fans. They're, you know, there's some sense of, of a lifeblood that they draw from KISS and from being a part of that tribe. And it's very powerful and it's very validating. And, well, uh, go ahead. I didn't mean on. to cut you off. Well, I was just going to no, say, I was going to say it was very humbling for me to see that. And very human. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Michael and I started this podcast, what, four, is it four years ago? Five. Five years ago. And I remember back to the very start when we were doing this, we are like, okay, who are the, like, the, the guys that you want to get on this show that we would love to have a chance to talk to? And you are like right at the top of the list because of how pivotal, pivotal those records were and your involvement in the band at the time. So it's great that you got a chance to see that there's a bunch of people like us that really, really appreciate what you did and your participation. It's important to us in our lives. So it's cool that you got to see that. I did, and, and um, I was very affected by it. I mean, I'm just being honest about it. It really affected me. It took me by surprise, but it really affected me, and uh, in a good way. And I thought that it was uh, was really great. You know, a lot of people reaching out to you at pretty quickly. You want to reach out for them too. And, yeah. Uh, well, it well, was Mi- a good thing. well, Michael. So let's let's go back to um, Kiss coming out of the Elder and starting to work with you on what ends up becoming sure. Kiss Killers. How did you? fall onto the radar of KISS or how did they fall onto your radar? How did you guys meet? Um, my attorney represented an act that was also managed by KISS's business manager. The elder had clearly not proved to be the leap forward that it might have thought or hoped for. And I had some reputation as being kind of a very song-oriented guy. So even though it seemed like an odd pairing at the time, it was a curiosity to me, um, we met up. And uh, I met with Gene individually, and then I met with Paul individually, and then I was asked would I get on a plane and fly to New York. At the time, I was making a record with Jesse Colin Young, and very melodic record, very acoustic record. He was the lead singer of the Young Bloods many years earlier, and uh, it it was a curiosity. I, I wasn't um, opting to produce Kiss. It 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 was a question that I had. So I went back east and and met with everybody and Bill Coyne, who was the manager at the time. And I think that Bill seemed to feel that I had something that was different that I could bring to the band. And I had sat with Gene and went through a ton of songs of his and uh, told him, look, you know, you don't have to do this with me, but if you want to, then I need to bring you to California and bring in some other co-writers who can make a contribution and We'll see what happens, but I don't want to start recording just to record. And I was pretty strict about that, and if 
if they didn't want to do it or Dean didn't want to do it or Paul didn't want to do it, that's fine. I mean, if I was going to get involved and try and make a record with them, then I wanted to do something that um, uh, really made a statement about quality. So so and how how did... I, I, I apologize. So how did... Or, or when you started this, did you know it was going to be a few songs for the Killers' Greatest Hits album? Sure. Or, or was there an intention that there was actually going to be a full album that somehow changed into Killers? No, it was going to be four songs. And um, because that was the contractual requirement that they needed. As I recall, I think I've got that right. But yeah, it, well, it, well, it, was it, was four, be... it was four new songs, right? Right. Yeah. And um, uh, there was some co-writing that went on. And, you know, The Elder was a very ambitious event. And Bob Ezrin is a friend of mine. And um, I wasn't there when the record was made. And it created some problems. I think the fans got confused, and you know, everybody knows there was a, a moment when the elder came out that everything kind of ground to a halt. Yeah, just kind of stopped. So, to me, to try and reignite a certain amount of momentum uh, was going to take some some material that would be compelling, and. Uh, so, yes, I knew that it was going to be four songs because that was the project at the time. Did I think that it was going to go on and become Creatures or a second record? I don't think I honestly knew. I don't really remember what I thought. It was a long time ago. But um, I don't think Mike, that Michael, I, I, have knew. A, I have a question about the four songs because one thing that Kiss was always known for, and they like to play up the Beatles aspect where... You know, on, on each record, you know, one guy would sing almost half, the other guy would sing almost half, you know, Ace would get a song, Peter would get a song. What I always thought was, was unique and, and cool, but on the four songs, all four are Paul Stanley songs. Was that because the material that was submitted, that Gene didn't have anything that you liked? Or was, was did Gene submit anything for those four songs, or is it strictly the Paul Stanley show? It wasn't intended to be the Paul Stanley show, but it it was the result of the better songs were the better songs at Fair that enough. time. At that time, do you remember getting anything I mean, for, I, for that? I'm sorry. Do you, do you remember Gene submitting any songs for Killers? Meaning, you know, Paul ended up getting all four. Was there anything that Gene submitted during that time frame that? I mean, was it that that he did record or that he did submit that you just went, hey, that's not strong enough? Um, Gene played me a lot of songs at the very beginning, and they either weren't complete enough or they needed more work. Um, but they didn't wind up on the record for a reason. Paul's songs at the time were, were seemed better and more more suitable. Uh, but did Gene play me songs? Yeah, of course he did. Now, now, obviously, as, as we all know, coming out of the Elder, things were just <clears throat> terrible in the world of Kiss. With yeah. within the yeah, band, were... within management, within the record label, everything. Was there a a conscious discussion with you and the band, and I don't know the label, anybody else? Of all right, this is the direction this album needs to go. Was there? a thought of we need to go back to being a rock band, a metal band. Was that ever a conscious discussion? It was a totally conscious discussion. It was, you know, you need to make sure that the fans are not confused about what happened and not confused about who we are. We did The Elder, and that seemed to have created some confusion. But there was a very powerful, decisive commitment to make a record that set the record straight. Absolutely. And everybody was on that page. Whether, you know, the thing about the creature's drum sound to, you know, all kinds of other things about the record, there was a real determination to make sure that the band sp spoke in their own voice and that they could be heard again. 
and that there wasn't going to be anything confusing about it. So, so how quickly after Killers, after you recorded those four songs, um, did they come back and say, all right, we, we want to stay with you and we want to do a full album and we're talking Creatures of the Night now. How, how quickly did that happen? Interesting question. I don't know that I remember exactly, but I think we just kept plowing ahead. And I think, I think, and I could have this wrong, and I should ask Paul. Maybe Paul will remember. I think that uh, while I was finishing up Killers, that we were also starting Creatures. That, or actually, maybe I shouldn't say that. I should actually check and verify because I, I'm. It, it's a murky area as to, but it's a good question, but it's a murky area. Because so, I, I, I can tell you from a fan standpoint, it feel it felt like it all just sort of, as you said, just happened at once and you were done with Killers and all of a sudden Creatures was happening. And that's what it felt like from the outside. I think that... Um, we worked well together. You know, I had certain ways of doing things, just like every producer has his own way of doing things and miking drums or doing whatever kind of process. And, and uh, uh, we did proceed. And, and I, I did bring them in, into the idea of um, some outside writers coming in and helping and contributing. And that continued on into Creatures. Michael, the, the, the one question that I, I think everybody here, and when I say that, I mean our audience, um, obviously you're working with KISS. Um, you started at Killers. Well, one portion of KISS wasn't there, Ace Freely. Um, was Ace ever involved from the start of Killers through, through the recording of Creatures? Because as we all know here in the KISS community, he did the... European Creatures of the Night tour, meaning the promo tour. But he's notoriously absent from everything all of us KISS fans have ever read um, through both Killers and Creatures of the Night. Can you shine any light? Do you ever remember Ace in the studio at any point during those two records? Or contributing songs or demos or anything? If he contributed songs or demos, they went to Paul, not me. And I'm not saying that he did and that they did go to Paul. I'm just saying if, in fact, that happened, and I don't know that it did or not, he would have run them past Paul first. I w will say Ace did play, uh, but I, I, I don't remember, a long time ago, I don't remember um, what he played on, but we recorded him in New York. Really, oh, See, that, cool. that is a and and, huge and let, let, so let me the, let me let me just well, make let me make sure you recorded him. Would this have been for Killers, or Creatures, or both? I honestly, at the moment, I don't remember. I mean, you know, it's a really long time ago. Sure, no, that's understandable. That's okay. No, so we it, just, it's but, possible it, on some of the bed tracks, you know, the basic rhythm tracks that. Ace right. may be on Creatures at some point? Yes or yeah. no? You, yeah. You're not, aren't you? Yeah. I, I mean, I remember we, we recorded him at Electric Lady. Wow. Wow. So Ace did lay down some guitar on Creatures. That's awesome. I, I don't, once again, you know, don't get me in trouble. No. I don't remember, <laughs> I don't remember, I don't remember whether it was on a track or, or several tracks on Killers yeah. or on Creatures. But, you, but he certainly was in the studio with a guitar recording for you. He, he wasn't holding a machine gun. He was holding <laughs> <laughs> Well, so we, I want to also talk about, well, there's so many aspects of Creatures that we're also deeply curious about. And I want to start this question off by saying something that, I, Mark, you may have been the one who told me this, that someone had asked Gene, you know, with the drum sound of this album and how awesome this record sounds, why didn't you do another one? And Gene's reply, if this is correct, was, well, right. that one didn't sell. 
Correct. So my question to you is this. How did you get that incredible drum sound? Was it Eric Carr's idea? Was it your idea? How did that come together? Because that's one of the number one things from the fans. They love the sound of this record. Mm -hmm. But go back a second to your original question that Gene answered. What was that question? Oh, I, I will, Tommy, I'll, I'll explain. You. I was with Gene back in Chicago, 2009, and I said to Gene, I said, I'm such a huge fan of the sound of Creatures of the Night. I said, how come you didn't replicate on the next record because it sounded so good? And he deadpan looked at me and said the record didn't sell, so we changed the sound. Okay, well, that's interesting. That's Gene's response. Um, here's the thing. I was, I grew up in a world of some really remarkable recording engineers. And just like everybody learns from whoever you work with, I learned a lot from them. One of the things I learned in particular was the value of a Telefunken 251 microphone, which may be one of the greatest microphones ever made. Uh, it's a German microphone. It's got a particular low-end response. And uh, certain engineers were also trained themselves to use th these mics on drums. So that was my orientation. So by the time that I met KISS, that's the way I recorded drums, uh, with Telefunk and 251s. On Creatures, Gene was eager to get back to a drum sound or try and find a drum sound that was as close to Zeppelin as could be made. I'm a record producer. So I know if you want to have the drum sound like John Bonham, then you have to give me John Bonham. You have to give me John Bonham's drum kit. You have to put me in the, exactly. in the same room that, that John Bonham plays where the drums sound like that. Nobody, nobody can turn something into something it is not. I once had a bass player from a different band call me at midnight and say, you know, can you get me the same strings that Jaco Pistorius uses? I want to sound like Jaco Pistorius. And I said... I have to get you his hands because, exactly. you know, yeah. it's, you have to be that person to sound like that, no matter what. I can go out and hit a drum a certain way. You can hit the drum a certain way. It's going to sound different for every single person. So, but there was a, as I said earlier, a commitment on creatures to do something that really clarified the definition of what the band sounded like. The elder, the concern was the elder may have kind of obscured that somewhat. And just to make sure everybody's clear who the band is, who KISS is, um, we focused on a lot of different things. One of them was the drum sound. Eric wanted to sound big and great. So I always had drum tuners in the control room. And I'd look over at them, and they'd look at me, and they'd nod. I'd go, okay. But if they heard one of the drums slipping in tuning, They'd look at me and say, stop, and I'd stop. And they'd go out in the room and they'd tune that particular drum. On top of that, we had Telefunken 251s all over it, and we moved Eric's drums on Creatures from one area to another area, trying to find a place where the drums could really speak. And we got this really powerful sound, and Eric was really pleased with it. And Eric, just to pause on Eric for a second, if anybody really loved KISS, if anybody ever really felt that KISS was a personal mission, it was Eric Carr. I mean, he, he was the proudest guy to be the drummer for KISS that I could ever imagine, and I had great respect for how much he loved this band. So he played his heart out. He would play, if I said, you've got to hit the drum 30 times until we get the sound right, he'd hit, he'd hit the drum 30 times. If I said 60 times, he'd, he'd do it 60 times. It didn't matter. So all to fold into what I was saying earlier, there was a big commitment by everybody in the band to try and make something that really clarified and reminded everybody who KISS really is or are. And uh, that's what happened. So we recorded the drums at record one in uh, the valley here. And uh, Nico Bolas was the engineer for, for those drums, and he was way into the idea of trying to really capture something that was unique. 
And we took a lot of time with it until we found that unique sound. Well, it sure worked. Whose idea was it to uh, get Bob Clear Mountain to do the, to mix the record? I don't remember. Okay. I, I mean, it, it could have been it could have been Villa Coin for that matter. Um, don't know, but uh, it was a very very good idea. And so when we were back in New York, we wanted to put the power station in Clear Mountain was mixing. It might have been Paul's idea. I'm not sure. Um, and it was Clear Mountain who had the idea, and he had done it on some other records that he did where he would, they had a defunct uh, like elevator shaft there at the power station, and he'd send the sound of the drums into the elevator shaft, and there'd be a tube microphone way up high inside, and it would pick up that huge sound, and the two things would get mixed mixed together, and with a good degree of taste, you'd wind up with the, the sound of Creature's drums. Wow. That's amazing. There were, so many, there were so many different elements involved. It's not just this elevator shaft thing, which is like a piece of mythology. It was a real dedication on everybody's part to do whatever it took to make it special. And well, it sure worked because it's one of my all-time favorites, and same with the rest of the guys here on the show. Well, um, thank you. It it it, it it's it didn't sell originally super well, but now it's aged like the finest of wines because that record, not only in 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 sound but in performance, always ends up in everybody's top. You know, if you're a Kiss fan, Creatures ranks really really high. And, always. Um, yeah. Always, and and that's something that Kiss fans, no matter when you jumped on the boat, whether you were someone from the start or if you became a fan last year, that's always a go-to. And and let's be honest, a lot of it not only are the songs there, but it sounds so good. And uh, I I did want to take this in a, in in a, another little direction. When did Mr. Uh, Vinny Vincent enter into the Kiss world with you? Because you were already, you did Killers with Bob. And I know they had some other guitar players. When were you first aware of Vinny Vincent coming in to uh, play with Kiss on the Creatures uh, era? You know, once again, it's a little fuzzy. and um, But he was certainly there in New York with us for Look It Up. Um, and Vinny made a contribution. You know, I always say that Vinny is very talented, and I think he is very talented. Uh, but there was a rub that so easily occurred between Vinny, Gene, and Paul, and somehow it just that blend couldn't exactly take place. So, you know, when did I first meet Vinny? I'm not sure I remember. Well, the uh, reason I was asking, um, Michael, is because uh, and I'm, I've always wanted to know the timeline because Bob obviously did Killers. You said Ace was around at the record plant during the Creatures recordings, but obviously he didn't play any solos. That's obvious. No. Things. But Vinny did. Solos. Pardon me? But Vinny did on Creatures of the Night. Well, there were there were a number of people who did guitar solos. Correct, on correct. But that, what I'm trying to, to get at is Bob Kulick was there, played the solos on Killers. Ace was in Creatures early enough that that Michael said he did record it some better. At least he did record some. You know, there was he did play guitar at some point. When did Vinnie Vincent? Because he did play on Creatures. Did he just show up like uh, the other guys did and play a solo or play some riffs, or was he introduced as a new guitar player? Yeah, if, I, if I were going to try and answer you, I'd probably go back and ask Paul. Um, for some reason, I keep thinking that Paul w would remember this pivotal moment. Um, so I'm not sure that I remember exactly which song, you know, but... Well, Mike, Michael, let me let me approach this a different way. What do you recall about Creatures of the Night when it comes to all of the various people that were brought in to play lead guitar on that album? 
I recommended Robin Ford. I brought in Robin, and Robin played on I Still Love You. Um, Steve Ferris played. Um, there was a, a bunch of guitarists who we, I can't say that we auditioned, but they came in and played, and the goal was to really see if there was a real blend that was occurring. And at all times, once again, there was this effort to really make a record that was special. It was really... Rick... Go ahead. I'm sorry, Michael. I don't mean to interrupt you. Please finish. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, was Rick Derringer one of them? Yeah, he okay. was. I think Derringer played on Exciter. Hmm. Yeah, that 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 that's widely known. What I would... What, what, because I want to move on to lick it up once we're kind of done with creatures, just because you know, killers and creatures. So all those guys came in, um, and Vinny ended up getting the job by default. I don't know if you'd know that, though, because that was more of a band decision. But I've always been curious, like, was he ever introduced to you as the new guitar player? But it doesn't sound like he was. It sounds like he was just another one of the guys lying, laying solos down um, on the Creatures record. By the time that we did Lick It Up, he was a more integral part of the experience of, of recording the band. And um, and he played. And I certainly certainly uh, saw him in the studio. He was in the studio with us, for sure. One of, the, one of the rumors I'd like to have you either say yay or nay to that's been going around forever is that Eddie Van Halen was around at the time and had cut some solos for creatures is there any truth to that uh not in my memory okay um speaking of why we're at the, the 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 crux here between lick it up and and creatures not for the innocent originally had paul stanley and jeans sharing vocals do you recall that in any way and if so was that done during the creature sessions or was that ex was that for uh the lick it up sessions obviously not for the innocent ended up on lick it up but there's a there's a bootleg out there um of paul singing the verses which to be honest i like that version better um mm -hmm. do you recall any of that uh, of that song in particular you know i'd have to go back and listen to really try and uh See if I can jog my memory. Mm. <laughs> it's, just, it's, such a, it's a long time ago. I know. We're hitting you up with all kinds of geek questions. Or our apologies. It's just we've been waiting to talk to you for so long. So we appreciate you just hang in there with us and answer what you can. Well, you, you know, know and, and Michael, part of what we, besides trying to find little minutia answers here, we like to try and just put together the story of what was going on at that point in time. What was the feeling what was happening because clearly i mean you you were there from from elder to killers to creatures to lick it up probably one of the most tumultuous eras of kiss without question and 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 you know creature the three of those albums are really really solid albums but you've got a band that on the creatures was considering taking the makeup off even back then but then does it on Lick It Up, Ace Fraley's leaving, Vinnie Vincent's coming in, huge changes. And we just like to try and, I don't know, paint the picture from people who were there. What was going on at the time? What do you remember of those, those events? I would just kind of respond with a, a broad stroke. I remember, as I said earlier, once the band was triggered to really have a determination to make music that was KISS music that KISS fans would recognize and respond to. That determination never went away for all the time that I was with them. And uh, they were committed. You know, they respect their fans. And so they wanted to make sure that, you know, they were giving the fans what the fans wanted to. And that, that mentality was always around. That was always of key importance. I don't know if that answers No, no, that, that, that's actually a really good answer. And, and what I wanted to kind of follow up on that is, so in, in your 
in your view and in your opinion, there isn't one single person who set the tone, set the direction. It was sort of the whole team, meaning Gene, Paul, management, and probably label, along with you, that said, this is what this is going to sound like. There, to success was all important, and to not pursue that was not a, was not a uh, realistic idea. Was there great determination? Great determination in the band, particularly Gene and Paul, to you know have Kiss stand proud. Do you think that they learned a hard lesson from the elder? I think that they learned several lessons from the elder. Yeah. I think it was, you know, it's very ambitious. It's difficult for any act to go do something like that, a real concept record at that point in the career. Um, I think that they learned a lot. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, because it was, at least from my perspective as a fan growing up, it was just a 180, and we were so happy with the way everything turned out that, you know, for me it was like, wow, they're back, you know? Mm -hmm. So the statement they made obviously worked. So then did you just continue? So how did you end up then back with them for Lick It Up, transitioning into Lick It Up? They went out on tour for the Creatures Tour. And then did they call you up and said, hey, you know, we'd love to work with you again? How, how did that all come about? We had developed a relationship, so we just continued. You know, it just went on. And it went on into Animalize. So that I cut the tracks with Animalize, but then I had to leave. They couldn't wait, but I had to leave and move on and do something else. Uh, that I was contractually committed to. Was that the Armored Saint then, album? Uh, which one? I think there was a, de Armored? a de a Armored Saint's debut album came out sometime right around then. May have been. May have been. I mean, I, I'd have to to go back and check that too, but uh, may have been. I, it's just that I was contracted and there wasn't an option and uh, and Paul pretty much finished that record. So, 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 just so I'm I'm clear, the intention, the initial intention for Kiss for Gene and Paul was to have you produce Animalize. It just didn't work out because you had commitments. Yeah, more or less, more or less. I mean, we had a good relationship. We just kept going. Um, that was 1980. You guys would know what year that was. 84. 84. 84, yeah. 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 Well, how is, how is working with KISS different from some of the other bands that you have produced? How, what's different about them? Probably everything. I mean... The good thing about Gene and Paul is that they so often have a vision of what works for them as kids. So with that kind of clarity, it's a great place to launch and start recording. Um, and they have such a strong sense of their identity. Were a lot you... of bands don't have that. A lot of bands are looking for it through the next record, maybe the the identity will change and really appear, you know, in the next record, better or different than the other one. Gene Did you Paul's. feel, okay, so yeah. one of the things that, that people have said, and this was probably after your time, uh, so you can't address it, but maybe you can, um, is that for a while, at least from our perspective, a lot of us as KISS fans, KISS at some point, not early on with Creatures or Lick It Up, but after that started to drift and it almost looked like they were... Um, uh, chasing other bands like, say, Bon Jovi and some of the other uh, large bands at the time. And it sounds to me, from what you're saying, is at least during the time that you work with them, they really had a solid identity and understanding of what they wanted to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And so some artists you work with, you show up in the recording studio or you, you do pre-production and they're just kind of like, do they, are they looking to you to go, Michael, help, help us shape this? Cause they really don't know what direction they want to go. Or they've got some ideas and maybe somebody like me comes in and says, you know, there may be a better idea than that. Or maybe the way that you're doing it is not quite as good as it could be. And you start working together and you find things that nobody walked in through the door thinking, but you discover things. And that happens all the time in studios. Okay. My, so Mike, Michael, can, can I ask you to hold for one second here? I, I need to add Mark back in. He dropped he lost. Off, he we dropped lost off him. our call real sure. quick here. Let me add him in. This is going great, by the way, Michael. Thank you so much for being so generous of your time. This is so exciting for us to have you here. I appreciate it. And there we go. So, Mar so Mark is back. So, so, Ma so Mar Mark, that? Mark, we. I'm sorry, you just missed the biggest bombshell ever. You're just. Gonna you're going to have to watch. You're going to have to show. wait until next oh. week. <laughs> you guys hear that? What? What? You guys didn't hear any of that? No. My computer started going, like, uh, get shut down, shut down, and I'm like, because I I bought this a couple months ago. I only use it for Skype. And it started freaking out. All right, I'm back. I, I thought you guys heard that. I'm like, what the hell? No, no, okay. no. All, all right, all right. So let 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 let's continue. So 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 Michael, let you know. I want to I want to back up a little bit into into lick it up. So um, the sound of lick it up, it, it's it's a great album, but it's not, it doesn't have the heavy sound of creatures. It's not quite as heavy. Um, what do you recall about any slight change or direction in the sound of Lick It Up compared to Creatures? Different studio, different room, same microphones, but different ambience, different room, um, different engineer for the basic tracks. Um, so the drums had a different character to them. And we weren't trying to emulate Creatures. We weren't trying to duplicate that. Creatures was a statement of its own. And so it appears that it did its job. It woke people up to the fact that Kiss was alive and well, as they had perceived them before. And that was, that was the goal. So Animal Eyes was, I'm sorry, Lick It Up was, like I said earlier, Give me a drum and put it, and give me a room and give me a microphone, and I, I can, I can give you, fifteen different sounds back. Maybe the sound that you're looking for is sound number seventeen that, that ambience is not going to produce. And I, I or any other producer can only do so much to, create something out of nothing. But, the record sounds great, and it sounds big and it sounds warm. And um, I haven't heard it for a long time, but I know it does. And uh, we felt good about it. We didn't feel that it had to actually sound like Creatures. Um, creatures had an identity of its own. It was a you know, determined statement that was made. And um, Lick It Up was the next record. So. I think Lick It Up is more melody based too. I, I you can Vinny's songwriting because he wrote eight of the ten songs. I, I think you can hear more less emphasis less emphasis on crunch because crunch was big on creature, but and, and not by a long shot or anything. But I think Lick It Up is more of a melodic album overall in, in my opinion. What would you think about that, Michael? Can you rephrase it a little bit? Hmm. I think Lick It Up has more melody to it because the songwriting was more consistent. All this, all but two songs were written by Vinny. And I think his stamp is more on that record where also, too, the, 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 the lack of the bigger drum sound also would emphasize more of a melody than the, than maybe the the stomp of creatures because creatures had a great stomp and i always one of my favorite songs and i think it gets overlooked in the kiss catalog is danger i love the drum sound it's that 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 bass drum shuffle just drives the song like crazy but it it doesn't have like 
the melody of something like you know exciter or uh oh on uh, uh on the eighth day that's got a very sing song sort of uh melody to it is that any clearer or am i still being too ambiguous well they're different records yeah and um you know different personality different time um once again, there was no, you know, effort or determination to make one record really sound like the one that came before it. If that clarifies anything, I don't know if it oh, does. De- de- def- definitely. Yeah. You know, what, what, what was your feeling? You know, you, you talked about on Creatures that you brought in some outside songwriters because you felt like they needed help with some songwriting. For the Lick It Up album... Did you feel like the songs that were coming into you were stronger right off the bat, that they didn't need that help that they needed on Creatures? Um, I think that on Creatures they got opened up to, you know, remembering some different things that they could employ, and the songwriting was better um, at the get-go. And... uh, uh, I think Paul did a great job. I thought Look It Up was great. Um, There's a lot of great stuff that occurred during that period, and and I think that the band was very energized about coming up with different material than they had before because I think that the momentum from Creatures really, really gave the band their confidence back after The Elder. And once again, I'm not knocking The Elder because... Like I say, Ezra's a friend of mine. Well, nor are we. It's just different. Yeah. Just different, and it it had its own kind of timing and um, didn't entirely work so well. So, Michael, another question that, especially in lieu of, like, Gene releasing the box, you know, the the vault that he's doing, um, is, are... Are you aware of how many, are there extra songs? I mean, one of the biggest questions in the KISS world, especially around this time, is uh, Vinny's song, Back on the Streets. Um, are you, do you remember that song? I do, and I really liked it because it was a really commercial track, so it, it was hard to not respond to Back on the Street. But, um, you know, ultimately, I think that Paul and Gene were, were both correct in that it really wasn't the band. But did, did Paul ever pull the lead vocal down? Do you know if, if that exists? Um, <laughs> uh, probably does. Okay. Probably I, does. That's, I, I, that's something that KISS fans have wanted to know. So you think, and, and again, I know you say, you know, some of this is fuzzy, going, but you, you tend to think that Paul did record a lead vocal for background. Look, once we cut a track, then it's quite possible, this is the, the, the best way for me to frame it, it's quite possible that we laid down a scratch vocal to get a sense of how the, the track really felt and worked as a Kiss song. It didn't work. So the song was melodic in a way that didn't really fit the, the character that the band was going for. So it wasn't going to go anywhere. On this is one I've, I've always wondered about, and this is probably a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm not a musician; I'm just a fan. Um, on the song "Lick It Up" itself, there's really no guitar solo, and I always wondered why that was. Was that something that you guys intentionally, or Paul wrote it a certain way, and it just fit the way it did? I mean, it's a great song as it is, but I always wondered why there wasn't really a solo on it. Um, I think at the time we didn't feel that it needed it. The song re- really had great energy and it had a very compelling feel and still does. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, w- w- when you hear it, it makes you move. Mm-hmm. And that's that's an accomplishment. So did it need a solo? You know, sure, it could have taken a solo. Did it need a solo? I don't think so. It's just unique, though, how KISS plays it now, because it's live, and it has been really, for quite some time, been different from the studio version. They 
they really have always kind of amped that song up a bit, um, which I, I, I actually prefer the live version. I don't remember. I love the studio. Version. It's one of my favorite Kiss songs. But are you have you seen Kiss uh, play it the way they've been playing it the last fifteen years or so? Yeah, yeah, Sounds pretty great. cool, pretty cool stuff. Hey, I, I guess since you were so um, close to the songwriting and the songs, which is so freaking cool. Um, Rock and Roll Hell, we know, is a, a Bachman Turner Overdrive song. How did that find its way onto Creatures of the Night? Oh, I, I surely don't remember the answer to that. Mm. Sorry. Okay, were, that's okay. Were you when 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 Lick It Up finally came out and was released? Were you surprised by them removing the makeup at that point, or was that something that you were aware of ahead of time that they were working their way towards all of this? Well, I think that they were working their way towards it to really see how that would fly. And uh, it was a big card to play. So, yeah, it was very significant for them and very important. And um, uh, that was a kind of incredible moment in time. Yeah, it it was, and, and the reason I asked that is because our Michael, our co-host, we both Michael and I grew up in Minneapolis, and Michael, to tell him the story about the calling the radio station. Well, yeah, so you know, I remember when Creatures came out, in your face, great heavy metal album, and I'm calling the local radio station KQRS, requesting it, and you know they don't give it the time of day, and then a year later, Lick It Up comes out. And they're playing Lick It Up. And I called the, the radio station. I, I asked the DJ. I played dumb. I'm like, oh, my God, who is that? Who's that song, Lick It Up? Oh, that's Kiss. They took their makeup off. Don't they sound great now? Yeah. I can see all that. It's just odd to me. You know, it, it's it, it, that's the other thing that I always find interesting about the music business is that, like, we have a lot of people here that listen to our podcasts that are professional musicians in, in working bands that grew up as Kiss fans. But it seems like so many of the contemporaries or their peers at the time, it was a real mixed bag of, of feedback of, of how they viewed Kiss and their place in in music. Did you ever find that in talking with different people like, oh, I'm producing the Kiss record and you got a, oh, really? Or, oh, that's cool. Did you ever have any conversations with other professional musicians who either got it or didn't get it? Probably every one of those scenarios occurred. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that's actually a very interesting thing about Kiss. There's people who love them. There's people who think they're interesting and adventurous. And there's people who don't quite get it. Um and, you know, you can't explain something that's about how something feels. Right. You know, that's that's not an intellectual conversation that you can have to alter somebody's opinion. that They either feel it or they don't, or they don't feel it one day, and then a week later they do. But KISS is really a unique event, and uh, it's very special. Michael, um... All right, bear with me on this question. We have to ask you this. We we ask this question amongst all of our special guests, and it's sort of just become a fun topic of discussion. Yeah, what a setup. I can't wait for that. <laughs> I know, after two paragraphs. And, and you better than anybody were right there. So the question is, did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? Did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? Yes. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Best answer ever. Best answer ever. <laughs> the two of us are in the camp. This is Tommy and, and Michael. We don't believe so, and, and Mark does. So, fantastic answer. And, 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 and Michael, it, it, comes, it comes from there are some fans out there who, who don't understand everything that goes on, like you just described behind the scenes, who see Vinny showed up on the Creatures of the Night album. It all of a sudden was a heavy metal album because Vinny was there, and it was his influence and his direction. And it's like, no, he had nothing to do with that. You know, there was all these other influences pre, pre-Vinny that set the tone and the direction of the band. 
You can just say that the drum sound set the tone for the record. Yeah. There you go. Which it, it, it did. It did. Yeah. Three. Absolutely. It, Michael, I here's something that I because these two guys here, they always kind of bust my balls about this. But but just as as a as a music producer yourself, this is here's why I say Vinny did. And now hear me out, it's not too long. <laughs> Had, had Lick It Up not been a big hit, and I'm talking about the single, that record would have tanked. And I think that, and like I said earlier, eight of the ten songs he co-wrote. Well, you need the songs, and if you don't have the songs, had Vinny not existed, that material wouldn't have been there. So that's why I think he saved them, because had, had Lick It Up not been successful... I don't know if the band would have stayed together. I mean, I, I, what do you think of that uh, statement? I think that Gene and Paul are dedicated, and have always been dedicated to KISS. The idea of the band wouldn't stay together is like not something that I can really go along with because I think that that's not the case. And I think that the band, by the time that we started Look It Up, was so energized so focused on doing something that if it, what Vinny contributed when it worked was great. And but I really can't can't get on that A train that Vinny saved the band. Okay. Yes. Fair enough. You know, yes. Just can't. I mean really <laughs> Time to change the subject. <laughs> I, want to I want to piggyback the question I asked you about back on the streets. Um, Michael, are, th are, there, are there any songs that you're aware of that were completed but never used from, from uh, I'm sorry. the band? And any song titles that you might be familiar with? From, I have from to that? repeat the question. Oh, you asked me to repeat the question? Yeah. Okay. Are you there song any titles... Song titles where songs were recorded but not used? Correct. Well, yeah, there were. I don't remember any titles, but of course there were. Okay, that, that's Maybe what I mean. So there are things from your time working with them that have not seen the light of day. Um, most certainly. I mean, you don't just record 10 songs. You record however many you do to try and find the 10 or 11 best. And... Uh, yeah, so somewhere there's some stuff, sure. When you're putting a record together, be it for Kiss or any other band, are you also part of the part of the group that decides the track order of everything? You mean sequencing the record? Yes. Yeah, of course. I mean, once you get involved in making the record, you're involved in making the record. And, uh, you know... That experience is as much an extension of you as it is for everybody else. Except you're you're ultimately not the artist; you're the producer and and whatever else. But yeah. So then that did that happen throughout? Like as you're recording the songs and things are coming together, do you start to kind of formulate in your mind? Okay, I think that we sh you know this record should start off with the title track on side A and and work it out that way? Do you try different sequences to see if one, one group sounds better than another? How, how do you do that? You kind of prioritize things. You, you hope to you try and tell a story. You try and provide an experience with the record that's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and where you put those high points or those not quite as high points, you know, you've got to fool around with to find something that feels strong that holds your interest through through the record and helps to make you feel connected with it so yeah no of course you're involved now you mentioned briefly how you were going to to do some work on the animalize album but other things came other things in in in, in your calendar got in the way anything post animalize into the 80s 90s was there ever any michael would you come back and do another album with us I, they had moved on and were moving, and so was I. And, um, you know, we always remained friends. And uh, uh, that didn't particularly come up, and I wasn't 
striving for it myself. You know, I mean, they made a lot of d- different kinds of records after me, and uh, that was all fine. But no, th- th- there was no, d- gee, let's go back and do this again at this time. No, not, not at that time. Michael, moving forward, uh, you're going to be at the Indianapolis Kiss Expo? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty exciting, because I know a lot of fans want to meet you. I have, I'll tell you, I had such a great time on the cruise. Um, it's really fun meeting them. It's, just a, it's a really great experience. So well, they, you know, the, the, the Kiss fans have embraced you. And so, like I said at the beginning, I'm so happy to see that you've had an opportunity to see what we've known forever. And how much he means to his community. You, yeah. Again, like Tommy set up at the beginning of this interview, the the person, you, you've you been the one we've wanted to talk to most. Honest to God. That, I appreciate that, it. I, I, I have been told that I became the missing link. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, and, and, and that's really true because as I said earlier, you are in that era of makeup to no makeup, elder to creatures to lick it up. It's such a huge period for Kiss that, mm-hmm. that you, you know, if, if, if coming out of the elder, they didn't do something as powerful as creatures and lick it up and they continued down an elder path, you know, the band may may have never survived it. They couldn't have done an elder part two. So no, you were no, there to, to keep them alive. No, a lot of people have said some very wonderful things to me about uh, the role that I played in, in the career. And I've been very grateful to hear that. Um, very appreciative. So, yeah. And like I said, once again, not to repeat myself, but the Kiss Cruise really informed me, really gave me the experience that was pretty great. What what yeah. what if what if Paul called you up and said we want to do one final Kiss album? Would you do it? Uh, I certainly talk about it. That would be I, awesome. I'd have a conversation. <laughs> okay, everybody, send mail to Paul Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, have that conversation. Uh, thank you so much, thank Michael, you. for nice joining us. Say so. And there's oh. one thing. Uh, there's one thing since you can cut this up as you wish. Um, but I was going to m- mention Mark earlier, and that was they were actually um, like selling my gold and platinum record awards on KissAddiction.com. Yes, plug away, my friend. And it, well, it would be nice if you wouldn't mind doing that. Of just course. Say, by the way. If you want any Michael James Jackson Kiss memorabilia, just go to uh, to kissaddiction.com. Perfect. Yeah, you got we'll it. Definitely. We will yeah. push, push, and push. Michael, thank um, you so much for for making the time. I under I appreciate that you're you're still a little under the weather, and you sat through three Kiss geeks that were just, <laughs> you know trying to get every little question that we've had since we first bought Killers, Creatures, and Lick It Up. You know, we wanted to get the answers. And we don't look like Larry Moan Curly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got I, a I picture, for they've got a picture of me. They've got a picture of me that these guys sell now, too. I look like I'm 15 years old. It was when uh, um, we got the, uh, the, the gold record for Lick It Up. And um, it's just... It's just amazing to look at that and suddenly realize that was a moment in time. You know, it was yeah. a moment in history. Yeah. So. Well, they were happy to get that one. Let me tell you, that was when the, the the ascension started up again, and it was all a lot of it because of you, man. Um, yeah, well, you you made so them much. sound fierce again. Well, you guys have been great. I enjoyed the questions, and um, I'm happy to come back and do this anytime you want again. Okay, oh. you... now go. Yeah. <laughs> Is that major Nusha or what? Holy Oh, shit. there's going to be heads. I tell you what, the news is going to be going, what is it with Kiss fans? There's heads blowing off all over the place. Oh, I know. Oh, and we're recording now, by the way. Yes. Ace Frehley 
was in Electric Lady with a guitar, says Michael James Jackson. Not a machine gun. Thank you. Remember, it wasn't a machine gun. You Did had a Benny Vincent save Kiss? Look Michael at the James time. Jackson. <laughs> really? <laughs> that was so awesome. God, Paul Stanley cool. back on the streets. Oh, oh. oh. So there you go, people. All right. We talked about. I don't know Kiss. what to say. That was just so freaking cool. Listen, I'm yeah. as as the, the Kiss fan and me is going. That was so freaking. I'm still like all geeky that right was now. I cool. know the best yeah. part. The best part. Yeah, let's do this. Think of some more questions. I love it. I have fun. Let's do it again. I'm like, can you come back? <laughs> <next week?" laughs> oh. I, I I don't know what to say. It's just that was. Freaking... I can't even come up with homework. It's like. Pick something, people. Yeah, yeah. yeah just your, you. your homework. Just something about Michael James Jackson, Killers, Creatures, and Lick It Up. And, and listen, we got the flat-out confirmation. He was supposed to do Animal Eyes and couldn't. And I'm pretty sure it was because he was committed to do March of the Saint by Armored Saint. I love that album, too. The March of the Saint. And oh, I, I I'll, I'll, not... I'll, I'll just admit right now, I bought Armored Saint, March of the Saint for the simple reason Produced by Michael James Jackson. That was does it. That have, does that have can? Does that have? Can you deliver on it too? Um, you, I think oh. so. Yeah. I although people get mad now that I, I talk about other band. On, I sorry. know. You try and well, you haven't talked about Deep Purple or Ted Nugent or I can. Yet. You want me to? Was <laughs> <laughs> there no. last week? No, oh, God, that was just. It. I just. I feel like. A bunch of holes in history have started to fill in. Mm-hmm. And and oh, by the way, Paul, have the conversation with Michael yes. James Jackson. Have that yeah. conversation. Yeah, watch. He's gonna get all this like Twitter shit now and emails and all this stuff. Where, where is this coming from? We should start a petition. That was a dream come true for a Kiss fan. God, yeah, dream come true. And, and and like I said earlier, we've been going back and forth on the phone, and I I, I, I wish we could have recorded. Although he, you know, it's funny he he talked about a lot of the stuff that we talked about, but he's just so fun to talk to. You know what I mean? Because he's just very nice, very professional. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. you know, and, and the words just flow out of the guy. You know, as you're like, I was hanging on every word. It was just so cool. And and I also want to say. Oh, God, I don't even know how to put this. He's just a nice person. That's it. Uh, again, when, 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 when I was calling him and we were playing tag, and, and I know Michael, and I don't know if I sent him to you, Tommy, because when we were going back trying to set up a day for the show, mm-hmm. he was always so gracious in his emails. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to not get back to you right away. And I was, it's, just, it's just cool when people take the time you know, to do stuff like that. And as you guys know, you know what? Uh, I've been having some, my, my dad's been in the hospital, and one of the times we, we, we talked in my dad's hospital, where my dad's looking at me, I'm like, it's a guy from Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and he's like, it was just so, you know, it was just so cool, you know. So. And, and, and listen, I want to make sure we, uh, we make a g- big mention here. Head over to kissaddiction.com. Michael is uh, has a bunch of his um, RIAA, RIAA awards. I'm looking at it right now. A, a deal certified deal. Lick It Up Platinum. Um, why did that just pop up? A certified Lick It Up Gold and a certified Creatures of the Night Gold album. So he's got three of his albums up for sale at kissaddiction.com. Um, listen, if you're a collector... There you go. I mean, it's funny. I need the creatures one. I'm probably not. Probably I am going to buy it. <laughs> we, we talked about that on the boat when I talked to him. So, uh, well, I already have. I already have a. I have almost all of them, but I'm really so, weird. I want. I want them to be like like real ones. You know what I mean? So but, then are you, so then are we are we saying to everybody, okay, guys, start bidding it up. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I don't think it's an auction. I think it's just not an outright. An oh, it's an outright it. purchase. Yeah, I, because he can because he was on the record he can get the make yeah, that's get what i mean this made. is genuine yeah these these are real the real deal 
Yep, yep. So kissaddiction.com. Check out the Michael James Jackson autographed. You know, you know, here's one here's one question. I knew the answer, but I did I forgot to ask him. Why do you go by Michael James Jackson as opposed to Michael Jackson? You you know the answer? Yeah. What is it? Because he doesn't he didn't want to be confused with Michael oh, Jackson okay. and he was actually getting royalty checks sent to him for Michael Jackson. Wow. I, I have it's funny because I if I, I hope I can dig it out, Mike, because I'd love to use it as the teaser picture. After the Elder came out in Cream magazine. Now keep in mind everybody knew the Elder was Total fucking disaster. This is why I say timelines everything. Cream Magazine put up, and it, you know the the WTF wasn't out yet. You know what I mean? How everyone used that for, but they like I for I'm gonna try and dig it out because I have every issue of Cream from the 70s and, and 80s. I'm trying to I gotta go dig that out. There was a part in the rock and roll news that said basically hold the phone. You're not gonna believe this. Kiss's next producer is Michael Jackson. And they were like mocking it, like you know, they just did right. the elder. Now they're going to go do some dance music thing. I mean, how more fucked up could these guys be? And I remember going, "You got to be kidding me! This is working with Michael Jackson because that's all it said." And you know, you didn't have the internet and any of that shit. You no, know, no. whatever. In, in 1981, I was 16. I'm like, Michael Jackson. I mean, they're like, we're serious people. I'm like, oh, you got to be fucking kidding. Well, I, I, Just when I, I thought the roller coaster couldn't get any more fucked up, now they're going to go do a dance record. Because that's I, what I thought. I remember when Creatures came out and I looked at who produced it, and I'm like, is that the same Michael Jackson? You know, I had no idea because, listen, I had no prehistory of Michael James Jackson. I didn't know him yeah. as a producer or anything for anybody prior to kiss so all of a sudden i see michael james jackson it's just like and remember michael jackson was exploding right then so it was a natural like oh my god is that the same this is pre pre thrill it was it was off the wall yeah okay was was this the the same guy he was so hot at the time michael jackson was so big and i'm like holy shit kiss is getting to work with michael but this is, and again, the 16-year-old mind is like, this isn't going to work. They're going to go try and do, you know, I was made for loving you again. And I, I was like, ah! And then, they, you know, then you find out, okay. And then when I, I, I will never forget putting down the, the needle on that one. The, duh, 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 I'm like, <gasps> Yeah. They're back, such, baby. such fucking great memories of listening to Creatures that very first time. Just like, heaviest you know, kiss, heaviest kiss record ever. And unlike the elder, at the end I was happy. <laughs> oh, it was just... <laughs> the story when the old kicked off. I was like, "Oh, they're back! Yeah. This is great!" Yeah. Oh, I'm ah. so happy with that interview. So happy. There's some people that probably won't be. But... I could give a crap <laughs> because you know what? I don't know about you two guys, but I do this show for me, and to get my questions answered, the geek in me, and the geek in me is loving this. And I don't give a crap about the rest of the other geeks out there because I'm happy as can be. I'm right. with you, my brother. Well, and you weren't disruptive. Yeah, I kept my mouth shut, didn't I? <laughs> this is so awesome. I almost heard 500 people shush me from Atlanta during the middle of that interview. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, it happened. It happened. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so homework, people. Pick something. Who knows? There's so much. Yeah. What do you love about the four songs on Killers? Creatures, Lick It Up, the production, the drums, the the his answer to Vinny saving kiss. You know, I don't give a whatever it is. What did you finally learn? What was was confirmed for you? What was denied for you? I don't care. Something. There's so much here that um, you can find something to talk about yep lots and lots and again for me that the, i've always wanted to find out if ace was ever even in the studio it's been verified that conversation is now off the table you've heard it over and over and over. listen i also think we've we've got the final answer to did Vinny save kiss 
Oh, yeah. The producer yeah. of the two albums he was on <laughs> said, really? What yeah. more do you need? You could not have scripted a better fucking answer. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, <laughs> you can't say you. Yeah, you. You're done now, Mark. Okay, you're done. Oh, this is as like, definitive as it gets. Can we not start? All right, start. All, right, all right, all right. Hey, 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 Derek, Derek, if you're if you're listening, I've got the perfect event for the Nashville Kiss Expo. On one end of the stage is Vinny, the other end of the stage is Michael James Jackson. In the middle. Three sides of the coin with a microphone goes, did Vinny save Kiss? <laughs> Vinny goes, damn right he did. Michael Jackson, James Jackson goes, really? <laughs> That's it. That's it. Just right Convention there. Convention over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mic, two mic drops, and they leave. <laughs> oh, man. So much. Oh, oh, Michael, thank you so much thank- for 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 taking the time and, and answering so many geeky questions oh and God. trying. No. And, you know, we didn't we didn't mean to put you on the spot on anything that you couldn't remember because God knows, you know, that was decades ago. And if any of us talk to Paul, we need to say, get a hold of Vinny, or excuse me, get a hold of Michael James Jackson. You guys get together. Have a conversation. Just have yeah. a conversation. Just okay. nothing more a than that. A cup of coffee. Talk. talk. Yeah. A cup of coffee. <laughs> Exactly. Get together. You know, go to Starbucks. Whatever. I'll you be know? there. I'll pay. And listen, if it ends up happening, just a little thank you three sides of the coin on the bottom <laughs> of the album. <laughs> Don't even have to thank you. Just make it happen. I'm oh, saying man. that to piss off all the people yeah. who are... Who? Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, look at you those guys. Their freaking egos are so big they want to be thanked by Kiss. <laughs> who doesn't? <laughs> All right, there you go. Three sides of the coin. We're out of here. Till next week. Later. Take three sides of the coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker T? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. For interviews and media inquiries, contact Izzy at izzypresleyproductions.com. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. You love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.